Our guest today is Wendy Lee, CEO, board leader, entrepreneur, investor, mentor, and community steward. I've had the privilege of getting to see Wendy Lee as she grew and amplified Centrifuge and the startup Cincy Rally and Cry. And now she is supporting ecosystem development across the country. Wendy, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast. Yeah, it's fun to be here. Thanks, Katie. So I know a bit about where your innovation story began, but would you please share it with some of the listeners? I would say the real beginning for me was not really as an entrepreneur. Because, I, you know, it wasn't like I need to go disrupt this or disrupt that. It was more when I had the honor and privilege to lead Centrifuge. I think that's when all the dots in my brain came together. <laughs> and I realized that innovation was more than just technology or a, you know, a new version of technology or a new category of technology, I realized that innovation first started with culture. And then there were the people that operated in the culture that actually made up the culture. And then there were technology innovations that, were aligned or needed to be aligned with processes. So you know me well. So my brain kind of captured all these elements that really were part of my job, as it so happened in Cincinnati. And then the light bulbs went off relative to the role that I had agreed to take and was so excited about being a part of, which is building an innovation economy. So again, the context of innovation for me did not come from corporate innovation. It didn't come necessarily as a siloed thing to help that company. It didn't really come from startups. I know both have innovation as a core piece of their growth. But for me, the reality of the value of innovation came when I got to see it through the lens of a community. Yeah. It actually held all these different assets. And if those assets could interact in a seamless way towards a big vision, that that would lift it, lift them all. And that would be a true innovation economy that could lead over time to economic vibrancy that would never be accomplished through traditional economic development. It's incredible. You know, so many uh, of the voices on this podcast have come from big co's or startups or venture firms. And the beauty of what you created and your team created through Centrifuge, this public-private partnership for entrepreneurial activity and, 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 and innovation ecosystem growth here in Cincinnati It was about creating a constellation and seeing innovation from across all of those different players and um, and not really just going at it from the lens of any one player in that system. And so the challenge there, I mean, having a big vision is a challenge anyway, (laughs) because most people, just as you said, they that's not what they're even having to worry about. You know, they're worrying about innovation through their functional responsibility or through the growth of their company or whatever. And by the way, that that's a gift too. you know, to be able to spark sure. innovation in a way that it moves the needle that way. Uh, the complexity, though, of what we were attempting to lead in Cincinnati was so it, it was so important to realize that it's all these piece parts, the collaboration of the constellation, if I could use your C word and my C word together. <laughs> I mean, that that's really the future, I think, of innovation. And they don't all happen at the same time. And that's where patience and resilience is important. When I say they don't all happen, if you look at all the nodes, as we call them in the ecosystem in greater Cincinnati, 
um, how the accelerators are doing, Brandery and you know Ocean and uh, and all the and the one in Northern Kentucky. Um, all those don't operate at the same rhythm forever, mm -hmm. right? They come and go. They have different kinds of entrepreneurs that come into their accelerator. So just using the node of ecosystem partners that look like accelerators as an example, you're striking and pushing and growing that node in a, as much as a, in a systematic way as you can while you are getting the universities online, mm -hmm. right? To be more mindful of their role in an innovation economy while you are bringing in large corporates that are ready for that kind of activity because they're not already at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the, and the point I'm making is that you can hold a big vision around innovation as a, as a single lens or as a community lens, it matters not. You can hold that vision, but you have to check in and really understand that existing situation of each segment or node in that ecosystem. Because if you try to do too much at the same time, the whole thing implodes and then people give up Yeah, because they don't, you know, they don't see the material benefit along the way. And to move a community you have to demonstrate your ability to execute in any of these nodes, at least a little bit. Now, that's not disruptive. That's just incremental. It's demonstrating there's an incremental path of innovation, improvement in that node. I see. Right? And, and otherwise, you just create a hairball of blah, blah. <laughs> right. And then right. people think you're just you know, whimsically talking off the top of your head rather than systematically executing based on your information and insight of that region's assets. So I am, you know, having left Cincinnati now 13, 14 months ago, um, I've experienced the challenge of building an innovation economy even with this very clear blueprint in my mind of how to do it. And when you're trying to apply that, it's not cookie cutter. There's a lot of nuance, forgive me, based on the culture of that region, the assets of that region, be they university assets, large company assets, the city's point of view on innovation, and just lining those up to make progress in a way that one makes progress that influences the other node. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And I'm thinking, you know, regional identity plays such a powerful role mm. in that activity. And, you know... Beautifully said. I totally agree. And language precedes behavior. Yes, yes. So quick flashback to my childhood. I grew up here in Cincinnati before we were identifying ourselves as a hub of innovation, as a growth center for innovation. And so I had no language around what an entrepreneur was. I Actually, I did a little bit with the Kauffman Foundation in elementary school, actually. So there was, it's kind of a fun, fun story. I came up with an electronic push button menu, which was supposed to be for fast food, or <laughs> you could just drive up and push the button instead of talking to someone. And now they actually have them. <laughs> anyway. Oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so there was, of course, some support, uh, and I think there, there's that's what sort of part of the American dream is to be inventive and to, to create things and, and do and make. But um, but in terms of an identity for the region that was really centered around tech innovation or medical innovation, really it, some of the things that we see now emerging. It was amazing to me as I finished up my PhD at Purdue and had that pull to want to come back home to Cincinnati and be part of this community. When I came back, it was a different world. And so yeah. much of that is thanks to the the storytelling that that Centrifuge and you, uh, your teams sparked at, with the hashtag Startup Cincy and that identity. And I will be completely frank to say that the the support that I sensed in the ecosystem and this, the way that our story was transformed as a result of that rallying cry 
it made me believe that I could do it and ultimately, you yeah. know, resign from my academic faculty job oh, yeah. and and do this full time. And um, and it continues to do that for people, I think, uh, to, to help us all sort of identify ourselves in that way. C- can you talk a little bit about the role of, of that startup sensei uh, language and how it played a role? Yeah, that's that's a good question. First of all, thanks for coming back to Cincinnati and and making a choice to be an entrepreneur. You know, it takes, as they say, more than just a little village. It does take a whole community. Yes, it does. It's not just the startup community. Right. Right. That's it is right. the whole community. And I certainly, while there, saw Arts Wave and the Chamber yeah. and very elite, um, you know, well respected, highly regarded uh, nonprofit organizations that happen to be well funded too. But I saw them support us. Yeah. Um, not just us centrifuge, but the idea of, you know, this identity that you're referring to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, a couple of things before I respond uh, directly to the, the beginning of Startup Sensi. It is important that we always remember relative to centrifuge and greater Cincinnati, which includes Southeast Indiana and Northern Kentucky. Right. So this is a regional play. It's a three state play. Yeah. Um, It took me a while to understand that. But (laughs) when I got it, it was very important. Right. Yes. yes. Um, Because of the influence we had on those other geographies, not just Cincinnati as a city. Sure. But it's the business community, the Cincinnati Business Council that should always be created, uh, be they should be given credit for their vision for their region. Without them looking around their peer city standings relative to risk capital that we in the greater Cincinnati region were receiving for those tech-based entrepreneurs. Now, there's a lot of entrepreneurs. Let's just talk about tech-based that decide they can, you know, grow through other people's money, VC money, risk capital. Um, Without them recognizing that, Mm -hmm. none of this would have been true. So that's really important because someone in wherever the community is, it could be Tampa, it could be a country. I'm working now in Taiwan, as you know. It doesn't matter. There needs to be a group of people. They don't all have to be business people. That decide is time for change. Yeah. And it's not to say the way we've been doing it in the past is wrong. It's not that black and white. It is that things are moving fast. Things are evolving. And our community and our people, be they entrepreneurs or large corporate people, whatever they are, professionals are now looking at the world differently relative to their role in it and their role in whatever kind of business. So I think that's really important because I have now learned what a true asset that was for centrifuge. Did you know it when you first when you first you came on this? I, I, I did not understand it at all. What did I know about <laughs> anything? I never lived in the Midwest. I mean, I knew P and Kroger. Knew quite a few things. I mean, you scaled a business to incredible. I mean, before. I had no clue what I'd <laughs> stepped into. I just knew that it seemed like the gifts I had, talent, knowledge might be helpful. Yeah. And I agreed to come. Anyway, I want to make sure we hear that. Um, because again, that foundation had everything to do with my ability and more importantly, the team's ability to scale at the pace we did. Because remember, we started with about a million dollars in seed money. Half of that was from the state. Half of that was you know, matched by corporates that really didn't know what they were matching. They just were communitarians. They were communitarians. They, they were capitalists in their day work, but when it come to us, they were just communitarians. But the story of Startup Sensi really goes back to uh, one thing I learned for sure in my close partnership and affiliation with Techstars. Um, although I never worked for them ever as an employee, I was an investor in their fund and a mentor for the Boulder Accelerator way back in, in the early days and still am now. But I learned a lot in watching them 
do their community work and yeah. build startup communities. And one thing I learned, and then I had learned about social media and storytelling while in California. Mm-hmm. So I came from a decade of social media technologies being on the rise and mm-hmm. actually led a startup that was involved in that category. It wasn't Twitter or Facebook or Google, but Get Satisfaction did, did some of that work and they leveraged the power of the web and unstructured data and social media. So I had learned just enough to be dangerous. So my <laughs> two my two big masters relative to my ability to execute on something like Startup Sensi first while I was figuring out all the other nodes along the way, really came from 10 years in the Valley, in San Francisco, the Bay Area, and tech stars. So I say that because ecosystem leaders have to do, you have to like figure out what you know and what you don't, and you're going to lean in to what you know, and hopefully have enough courage to learn the rest. So I have to (laughs) you know, pay homage to tech stars and also to social media and, and Silicon Valley and get satisfaction in particular in Twitter and Facebook because I had to learn how those things operated, right? Absolutely. The power of a network. Yeah, yeah. That was really important. Okay, so that was that. Then um, it was really Eric Weissman, um, who was my thinking partner and my execution partner Um, He was on the team already. I didn't have to hire him. I was very fortunate to have him there when I first started, which was October of 2014. And so he, you know, he's not a pure play marketing guy. He's a lover of his community. He was born and raised in Cincinnati. He had a spark for entrepreneurship. He worked at some corporate. So he was perfectly suited to help me ring lead, if you will, and get a megaphone, if you will, and start branding, if you will. And I'm not a branding professional. I mean, that's what P&G marketers do. I didn't do that. But he and I were able to piece together in a very short period of time, getting help from LPK. I mean, we had to leverage any help we could find because we had no yeah. people or no money. We were a startup. Yeah. And I was not the founder of the startup, nor was I first the CEO. So think about that sense of urgency I had to bring this to life quickly. But we, and we could only find 11 startups in the mm. t- that were in our database, but we knew that was silly. We knew there were more. Yeah. So it was really under Eric's leadership when I was trying to figure out a bunch of stuff that we decided to use the hashtag startup sensing, which already existed. Mm-hmm. Okay? It existed because Dave Knox, who was a very esteemed member of the community, former PNG, co-founder of the Brandery. When I got there, and I did know him um, because I worked with him at PNG when I was leading Get Satisfaction, he said, you can have that hashtag, light it up. So that <laughs> gave us yeah. an existing hashtag with Eric. And we we had nothing to lose, right? Because there wasn't a strong in my humble opinion, strong momentum. There was some momentum yeah, because of Cincy Tech, because of HCDC, because of the brandery. So to say there was no momentum is not true. Right, right. But I was trying to not just make it louder, but create a narrative that we could systematically push that would put tech-based entrepreneurship in the middle of the discussion while I was doing my best to scurry around and figure out what else existed because I didn't know. I didn't know that corporate innovation was that big of a thing. I didn't realize what a perfect inflection point we were in. I didn't know how the universities were set up or not for entrepreneurship. I didn't know a lot, but what I knew for sure based on learning from tech stars and my partnership with them and based on my experience with social media, that if we could do a little bit of storytelling through a hashtag that already existed, thanks to Dave Knox, we could be on our way. At least we'd know what the entrepreneurship community looked like. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that's how that happened. 
It's it's such a powerful story. It's, you know, I'm curious as you're trying to pull together voices from all of these different nodes, as you say, how do you get them to try to speak the same language? Were there certain strategies uh, that you use to to build those relationships, get them seats at the table together, um, and, and help tech startups be able to, you know, get that pilot opportunity in our regional big co's and to get university talent recruited and all of that? Well, it's interesting. Um, and this would play, answering your question, plays to uh, a natural skill I have, and that is the skill of communication and presenting a story to others. Um, So I'm an outbound person (laughs) with deep fascination, though, for execution. Mm -hmm. So I'm weird like that. Like I'm I'm competent when it comes to outbound storytelling and I'm dedicated to internal execution across uh, a plan. Mm -hmm. And because I've only ever been an entrepreneur, I only worked for one big company sans my early schooling, you know, when I was acquired by one. Mm -hmm. And so my whole life I learned about sprints and planning in short time periods so I could iterate. This is before I even understood all those words, right? That's just <laughs> what I had to do naturally because I didn't have a lot of money. But, <laughs> but what I decided to do in Cincinnati, which was so phenomenal to experience because it was a very tight community that was naturally inclusive of all these segments or nodes, naturally so. It's the way the Midwest sees the world. That is not the way the West Coast sees the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the Midwest has this natural communitarian way of being. Sure. And and, And that played to my ability, my strengths as a communicator. So what I decided to do is to just, with Eric Weissman's help, to nail the story enough, the story of what we were trying, the vision and the story of what we were trying to accomplish in a very short period of time. Cause you know, I never planned to stay there forever. It, there was no mm-hmm. need to, I was, I had a role, I had a job, I was paid to do it. I was excited about doing it. I wanted to make a difference. But if you think about that and, and you don't have a lot of money or a lot of people, you have to take the leader who's naturally outbound and you have to start, storytelling in every venue you can find. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, think about it. Right. So I know. I yeah, mean, yeah. Eric would know all these stats. Already <laughs> me. I bet I presented to, you know, 30 or 40 different groups like the first year. Sure. With not even a very pretty PowerPoint. Right. <laughs> and and it wasn't that tied down with enough data. There was no data. It was just a big vision. Yeah, but yeah. Oh, but at least what I did is I started to your point embedding the language. Yes, yeah, of not just tech based entrepreneurship, right? But of something I knew they understood, which is economic vibrancy. And I was learning from my economic development partners. John Reeder was leading Ready at the time, right? She had to teach me what economic development was. I mean, I knew conceptually, but I'd never participated in it. So I had to take some of her language, some of the mayor's language, some of the Ohio Third Frontier's language. I learned a lot from uh, Mike Venerable at Cincy Tech. So I had to squeeze all that knowledge in a narrative very quickly, realizing it would not be even close to perfect, but it gave me a, a platform to get out. And I spoke to the United Way people, to, you know, the Queen City Club people, to the, you name it. I was out presenting because I was now a community leader. Yes, that's right. And by the way, it lit me up in ways I couldn't even believe. (laughs) But to your point, I had to get the story good enough to start 
And then I got a lot of feedback and sometimes confused faces in the audience, like, what the heck is she talking about? I would go back and refine it. And then we would execute a little bit more than I'd add some data to it. Um, so I got better over time, which is what professionals do if they're paying attention to their work. Um, <laughs> but that's really how it started. And then we had plans for strike points around Startup Sensi. And as soon as I saw that momentum moving enough, far from perfect, but it started moving and people started gelling, the interdependencies of the accelerators and everyone involved in entrepreneurship, that was coming closer directionally. It was going in the right, and not perfect. There were still meltdowns and fights about who did what, whatever. But we didn't, <laughs> we couldn't do everything. We were only the big tent that influenced and supported yeah. all the, the people on the ground. And that included all the accelerators and everybody else. So once that got going, there was no need for me just to do that, right? Because it had its own juices then. And Eric and everyone else involved were as involved as they could be. Um, and so then I got to go down and execute more deliberately relative to the VCs we're investing in relative to the universities, relative to the corporates. I mean, that was hard work too, but that we, we sparked a big tent that at least had people like you that were thinking about entrepreneurs. At least they were coming together with their t-shirts and their questions and their concerns because they didn't want to be part of something that was just not going to be true, right? They mm -hmm. needed to mm -hmm. feel that there was something real happening that there was some change happening, that conditions were being set differently for them to thrive, them equally yes. entrepreneurs yeah. like yourself. It's unbelievably important, I think, to keep in mind how a city like Cincinnati was overlooked for innovation you know at the time you know early 2000 you know mid 2010s or early 2010s right and, and this is still true that most entrepreneurial activity is happening on the two coasts and most of the venture dollars are going to the east and the west coasts but new research you know you and i like to geek out yeah. on all of the, the latest research around innovation activity and you know, the, I'll link in the show notes the latest Brookings report that the you and I looked at together, and you see potential innovation growth centers. It, you, first of all, you see more isolation in where entrepreneurial activity is happening, where innovation is happening across the nation. But you also see the Midwest lit up on a map showing yeah. that this is happening. These these are potential centers, and they're they're growing, and, and they're increasing in their density and maturity of startups and, and 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 activity. But I think it's interesting that, that there's a lot of space on our nation's map that is not lit up, and to hear how a city like Cincinnati was transformed in such a short period of time, and that wasn't only because we told a good story, it's because no, no. we were active and, 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 and made it happen. This is hard work. I mean, this, is not, this yeah. is not about a tweet, right? This is really hard work, this meaning building an innovation economy, right? It yeah. sounds all yeah. fancy pants and very abstract. <laughs> you have to make it come true by doing the work yeah. of attracting yeah and developing and retaining entrepreneurs and by connecting those entrepreneurs to really smart people inside large corporates and those people that might over time, not just mentor, but actually use your products or services. And by helping you connect to resources that you need when you're ready to use it, other people's money, if you choose to do that, it's very, very hard work. So I think, yes, yeah. So if you look at St. Louis and Kansas city and Louisville, and Columbus, and Cleveland, and Nashville. Yeah. I mean, this is a thing. Yes, the, yes. The yes. thing of innovation economies. Now, I want to make a distinction here that's so important to what I know to be true, and that is building a startup community as cool and fun and exciting as it is with a hashtag fill-in-the-blank city 
and with the t-shirt and with beer and pizza and all that and meetups and a cool <laughs> co-working space like Union Hall or wherever it may be, that's not enough. Right. The startup community alone is the heart of the engine required to drive economic vibrancy. But the ecosystem leader, and in this case, you know, Pete Blackshaw runs Centrifuge. And his job is to ensure that all the nodes, the segments of the ecosystem that have been introduced to an innovation economy over time is to keep them engaged. And that doesn't just mean come to the annual meeting. Okay. Right. Because ecosystem leaders do get wrapped up in a bunch of showy activities. I did. But I also, when I would go home at night after a bunch, a day long of activities, because we love those in Cincinnati, right? <laughs> I had to go home and, and think, how do I translate that activity, that room full of people that are finally getting our language and they're understanding the role that the core of the engine, the start that entrepreneurs have, how do I get them to apply the language inside their own entities so that it brings real benefit to their institution or their enterprise. That's the trick. And that's mm -hmm. why the work is hard because it's not Absolutely. just outbound marketing work. It's equal parts of hardcore planning against uh, you know, burn, like you don't have a lot of money and you can't have a lot of people and, and all the things that I learned in startup land, right? Yes, I got to absolutely. apply all yes. those lessons. So I think, you know, it is now become a thing and, and we should pay homage also to Steve and Gene Case and Rise of the Rest, that initiative yeah. that he started some seven years ago had a huge impact, at least in the middle of the country, because he would make big investments, not just, I don't mean financial investments, but his time, his energy, his talent. He would ring his own bell of Rise of the Rest and everyone else's bell, right, to prove yeah. not just to startups that they could do it and write a check for 100K in each city to one, but also... <laughs> He would storytell, Steve himself and Anna Mason and that now Mary Grove, that whole team, they would storytell to business leaders and they would storytell to the political and community leaders. So in the spirit of your podcast series, I want to make sure those listening understand that at least in the middle of the country, he set conditions with his own energy and talent that were phenomenal and amazing to me as an outsider. And now I'm very involved as part of his export expert network. I help his portfolios. I go with some, them sometimes to their city tours. They're just about to take one, you know, to Arkansas and to Kansas city. They're working on their, I don't know, I think it's number nine or 10, but, yeah. but, but that is to say, back to your comment and your own expertise, untold contents expertise around storytelling, that the story, the stories come mm -hmm. from a big vision, which someone decides there's real opportunity for them, their region, their business in. Yes. And yes. then the storytelling is around the success of implementing the vision over time. It's not one yes. story yep. about one right. entrepreneur. Right. It's right. not only yeah. the story of the entrepreneur that raises a bunch of capital, right? It's a story of the dark night of the soul as well as the big raise. It's a story of corporate innovation in a time when their sector was being disrupted. It's a story mm -hmm. of arts wave, being a part of talent attraction in Cincinnati yes, because yes. of their own ways of innovating. So every leader in Cincinnati was able to do their part in building out an innovation economy. 
in a very critical, essential part of Ohio, Southwest Ohio, a very interesting part of Kentucky, Northern Kentucky, and an equally important part of Southeast Indiana, who was on fire relative to Indianapolis. On fire meaning things are going well, but they need to spread those fires out to other parts of, of Indiana as well. So mm-hmm. that's a point of view I wanted to share. I- I'm so grateful for it. Something else that we haven't talked to too much yet, though we mentioned Rise of the Rest, one of the most brilliant strategies, in my opinion, around centrifuge was your ability to get venture capital into our city and in, really inject it. And, and that has to do with your fund of funds approach. Can you speak sure. to that a little yeah. bit? A thumbnail on that, because it goes back to the Cincinnati Business Committee and the number one problem they were solving for yeah, relative right. to the new public-private partnership they established called Centrifuge was the fact that they were so low, they were so in the depths of despair, rel- we were, they at the time, I wasn't there, relative to risk capital coming into the region. It was yeah, minuscule. Yeah. It was sad. Mm-hmm. It was pitiful. And so McKinsey helped the business council do research to see why that was and to look at other options or other strategies that they might employ that would catalyze improvement, right? Yes. And that's when they raised their first, the first fund of funds. It's called the Centrifuge Syndicate Fund. Um, And all the large corporates were LPs. The ringleader of that discussion was, at the time, the CEO of Procter & Gamble. His name was Bob McDonald. He's been gone for some time, but he was a non-trivial part of the leadership team, along with Tom Williams, in this first fund of funds. And, And it was very controversial, and it still is. And the reason it was controversial is because the money was raised in Cincinnati through very large corporates. And now that those LPs have have been expanded to Northern Kentucky and to other parts of Ohio, but it was raised. And then it was invested in VCs, not in Ohio or Kentucky or Indiana. Right. It was shock horror. Money was deployed outside. It was a national play. And that story was hard, right? That that's a hard story to convince in a communal, in a communal culture <laughs> like in the Midwest. That was horrific. Yeah, unheard of, right? Why didn't you invest in startups in your backyard or inve- only in venture firms? That's right. Here? We didn't even directly invest. That was not the the prime reason, right, right. right? We did some direct investing after startups were doing really well and had raised rounds, and it was deep risk. But mainly, the fund strategy was about getting exposure to highly proven early stage seed funds, not just on the coast, but across the U.S. And the benefits to that strategy are and have been non-trivial to the success of Centrifuge. And they are threefold. One is to return capital to the LPs. This is not a nonprofit. The fund of funds is a for-profit entity. So we want to return capital like every other fund of funds. So we have to make good investments. Tim Schigel, Sarah Anderson, founding team, smart, smart, smart. They ensured we did, we did that, right? Number two benefit is to provide the corporates access to early stage innovation. Well, you say, well, why would they need that? They can get their own access. It is P&G and Kroger and Children's Hospital anyway. Well, because they would get access to different kinds of innovation, like over time that was well invested in and had been de-risked, right? So that was good for them. They wanted access to early, early stage innovation and the VCs who were looking at lots of deals in different categories. This is a cross-sector play, right? Yeah, cross-sector. Yeah, absolutely. Then the third benefit, which to us was almost the most important. When I say to us, I mean the Centrifuge overall team. 
And that is to give our entrepreneurs a chance to develop relationships with VCs that likely they would have low chance of meeting without this fund of funds. Right. And, and so as their metrics improved and as they saw growth, we wanted to be prepared to make introductions that matter. We couldn't make our, the VCs invest. That wasn't our job. That would be silly to, to build that into commitments. Why do that? That creates adverse selection. But I want, we wanted to make sure that we had a network of early stage VCs that we had invested in, as well as VCs that we wouldn't invest in for a range of reasons. They didn't have a proven track record or whatever. Um, they were emerging managers. Um, we, we, we needed them to know them as well. So, so the fund was a flypaper strategy to draw lots of VCs to the greater Cincinnati area through a relationship with Centrifuge and their interest in having good deals, but to knowing our corporates. It was a win-win-win. It was a maximalist strategy for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Complicated. Yes, it, it's paid off. And it's, it's right. paying off. But there's a long runway here right? It, it'll pay off over time. This is not a short-term fix and not a short-term strategy. And um, everyone knew that. Still, though, we have to have a lot of resilience and patience and execution capacity to continue to iterate the strategy so everyone sees benefit. Yes? The VCs, yeah, the great. corporates, the entrepreneurs, our advisors, it's very governed, this asset, as it should be. So I learned so much. I mean, honestly, <laughs> it was my first time to lead this kind of an investment strategy or fund, not possible without the advisory board we had and Tim Shigel and Sarah Anderson and all those Nick Faulkner that supported them. So yeah. What an honor it was to learn about it, to be part of it, and now to share that expertise with other states, which I do all the time, as you know. Yes, yes. Tell me, you know, when you're traveling around the world and you're traveling to different cities inside of our nation as well, what what sorts of stories do you find yourself sharing around how to leverage innovation in order to create economic vibrancy? Um, well, the stories, I'm going to go back to the framework I discussed when we first started. And that is, first, there is, there needs to be a cultural understanding by the state, the city, the region, the country. There needs to be some sensitivity that there are things happening around them that are bringing some unique pressure to them that needs to be investigated. Um, institutions that have been doing the same thing for too long and maybe mm -hmm. are beginning to be perceived to not bringing the value that they once did, right? Sure. So sure. that cultural observance, if you will, is the storyline that I try to stay on first because you yes, can't yes. force this, right? But what we know is all geographies have a responsibility to their existing citizens to provide vibrancy. Vibrancy through yeah. schools, right? Through government Good services, yeah. right? Um, so there's, and, and so there are cultural elements that either lift that up and open it up, lift and open, so people, you can start having that conversation, right? And, and I remember even when Jill uh, took on the role as CEO of the chamber, because I'd been there a couple of years before she became that leader. I mean, she's a great example. So the Chamber of Commerce in Greater Cincinnati, they knew that there was a new culture happening. 
mean, take me out of it. They knew that without me telling them they had to do it. So I'm looking for those examples of leadership changing, not just, you know, women leadership or people of color leadership, but I mean, is leadership awake of what's required now to ensure the future, there's a future for the region? And so yeah. I look at the cultural element, and I must say, again, everything this I learned in Cincinnati, I look at the universities deeply. And it took mm. me a long time to figure out how a university really operated, you know, as an mm. institution. I was very naive about that, so I had a lot to learn. But again, they are a central asset to economic vibrancy because they are in charge of educating youth, yes, making yeah, them feel the hopeful talent. that they can get yes, a job. Yes. And those institutions need to be looking actively at ways to keep those smart, bright, motivated, ambitious humans in their own dirt. Yep. And to yep, give them absolutely. optionality relative to jobs. So yes, I think it's cool yeah. that so many Miami, Miami grads go to PNG. I think that's way cool. And I think it's way cool that so many UC grads, you know, from the engineering school go to university, uh, go to Kroger. All that's cool. But I know for sure that young humans in these schools see the world with a very broad lens now. And they don't mm -hmm. always want to do just what their mom and dad did. Right? Yeah, and even yeah. though their mom and dad may be corporate executives, very esteemed, highly regarded corporate executives, that does not equal that they want to do that. So I think That's universities right, yeah. have such a significant role to play. And I think they're waking up to that. We're so fortunate because Greg Crawford, the president of Miami, is an entrepreneur himself. He's very actively involved, as is his school and everything going on in startup since the University of Cincinnati, beautiful example of now activating their innovation corridor. Yes? Yes. In yep. KU, very, very active across the river with their all their digital talent and their cybersecurity program, which is second. Those people get jobs before they leave, both startups. You know, they go to do startups and they go work for the government. These are cybersecurity brains, right? So yes, yes. I think, you know, when I'm in a city, I'm seeing what role the universities play. I'm seeing what role, what I would call the infrastructure enterprises like the chamber play. I'm looking at the language of the mayor or the governor. Yep. And I'm saying, okay, what are we talking about now? What are your talking points? relative to the future of your community, you mm -hmm. know? And so I can pretty quickly assess by doing, you know, just secondary research, kind of that the cultural situation and how they're maneuvering, what policies, what programs, what entities they're engaging. Of course, I can look for the entrepreneurship community. I can look for the startup community. That's the easiest thing for me to do. <laughs> but now that I've had this other experience, I'm looking across the board, the whole ecosystem to see, are they on the right track? I mean, I'm not trying to yeah. judge it as much as I'm trying to coach and advise and let them see that just going to get another big factory from Brazil or Germany or to get Amazon second headquarters, or Google to invest in a in a in a you know a, a campus like they do here in Boulder. Those what I call traditional economic strategies alone are not going to keep you and your family in a region. It's, it's not going to happen, right? Because you need to see that there are cultural elements. You need to see that people are not just cool coffee shops, but they're places you can go to see people like you, right? That you can connect with and feel a part of. That vibrancy is not just tech talent. That's a, that's a dimension of it. And 
this the diversification and the inclusion strategy of a region has never been more important than it is now. And I'll end on this because you ask about all these other cities. If you think of all the cities who have now been vacated because a big manufacturing plant was shut down or the coal mine was shut down. I mean, we could even play an immigration card and think about bringing lots of people that want community and want to work into places that have been gutted. And that may not be a tech economy play, but that may be a play for people to come into our country and to actually bring life back to a city or a region who, for whatever reason, was gutted because of one industry's disruption. Yes, like the coal miners. And I think that this whole notion of entrepreneurship is very broad. Although my job has already always been around tech itself because tech is an enabler and it's horizontal, right? And the jobs are high paying. There are all kinds of good reasons to focus on that part of entrepreneurship. Main street entrepreneurship is just as important. Bootstrapped entrepreneurship without other people's money, just as important. So I think The dream of America is that people can come here with the right spirit, work hard, build a business, take care of their family, and continue that tradition for generations to come. And that's what I'm excited about for us and our future here in the United States. If you are inspired by these ideas and you want to uh, dive in even more, Wendy, you've published an incredible series Um, on economic vibrancy, where you're looking at each node of this ecosystem and thinking about how to utilize innovation to spark a larger regional identity and to accelerate the speed of innovation in those regions. So I'll link it in the show notes. It's it's a beautiful series. I'm so grateful that I had you on the podcast, Wendy. Thanks for making time. It It was an honor. And thanks for all that you guys do for Cincinnati and that you've done for me as a partner. So I can't wait to listen (laughs) to the podcast and I'll do my part to share it with others that I know are trying to learn about innovation economies. Awesome. Thank you, Wendy. I hope you have a good day. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.